Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the DJAP Morning Briefing on Geopolitical Challenges. I'm Henning Hoff, Executive Editor of Internationale Politik Quarterly. Russia's war against Ukraine enters its uh, 435th day. We saw a spectacular drone attack on the Kremlin the night before last, uh, with the Kremlin blaming the Ukrainians. Um, uh, President Zelensky has rejected this, um, and uh, um, he's he's been visiting uh, Finland at the moment, and we expect him uh, in Berlin soon. It will be his first visit uh, to Berlin um, uh, since the start of the war. Meanwhile, Moscow has resumed its terror attacks on civilians and earlier hitting the residential building in Uman, in the center of the country, killing 19 people, including three children. There have also been attacks on a supermarket in Kherson yesterday. Innocent civilians not only are dying at the hands of Vladimir Putin's forces, the situation in Sudan continues to be highly volatile, and this is the focus of our briefing this morning. The current crisis started on April the 15th, when deadly clashes were reported between the so-called Rabbit Sport Forces, or RSF, led by Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, also known as Hemeti, and the Sudanese Armed Forces, or the SAF, under the command of Sudan's de facto ruler, Army Chief Abdel Fattah al burhan Foreign nations, including Germany, with its Bundeswehr, launched operations to evacuate diplomats and others, while various ceasefires have been declared. Until now, none has held. Hundreds of civilians have already been killed. After the ousting of the long-time ruler, President Umar al-Bashir, in early 2019, and as a consequence of subsequent popular protests, Sudan had a civilian government for two years before the military returned to power. The conflict between the RSF and the SAF was predictable and indeed predicted. The conflict is far from an inter internal one. Inter alia, Libya's General Haftar and Russia's Wagner Group support the RSF, while Egypt has been reported to have intervened in support of the SAF. To discuss all this, I have the pleasure of welcoming three excellent speakers. In order of appearance, we have with us Marina Peter, founder and chairwoman of the Sudan and South Sudan Forum. Marina has been actively engaged with the country for almost 40 years. Inter alia, she is an advisor for Brot für die Welt, the development and relief agency of the Protestant churches in Germany. She shares her assessment of the situation in Sudan. She was in South Sudan until very recently. A very warm welcome, Marina. Thank you very much. Next, we will be hearing um, from Dr. Gerrit Kutz of the SWP, the SPP, the German Institute for International Security Affairs in Berlin, where he is part of the Africa and Middle East Research Division. Formerly a colleague at the German Council for Relations, uh, Gerrit is one of Germany's leading experts on Sudan and Ethiopia and will share his views on past and present stabilization efforts by the United Nations, led by former SWP Director Volker Pertis, and others, and his also outlook for the conflict. Warm welcome, Garrett. Good morning, Ed. And last not but least, and last but not least, we'll be hearing from my DJP colleague, Dr. Arnold Schwarz, a leading expert on the Russian military, who you, of course, all know from his excellent military briefings on Russia's war against Ukraine in this event series. Andras will be talking about the infamous Wagner Group and its activities in Northern Africa. Uh, I should also mention that he has to leave at nine o'clock. Um, welcome, Andras. Thank you. Good morning. Each speaker has six to seven minutes for the introductory remarks. We will be opening for your questions and comments after roughly 30 minutes. Please um, raise your hand, introduce yourself, and put your question uh, in person to the panel. You're also welcome to submit questions and comments via the chat function. Please note this is the event will be recorded and that we'll have to close on time at 9.30 a.m. And with a word of thanks to Milan Nitsch, my DJP colleague um, and Central Eastern expert here at the German Council of Formulations, who's been instrumental in organizing these events, and to Dr. Jan Stöckmann from the director's office, who is supporting this series going forward. And also to my colleagues in the events and communications teams, let's turn to Marina. Many thanks uh, for inviting me to address this very distinguished uh, audience. Let me just put a small correction. Uh, you said I'm 40 years already uh, basically with Sudan. That also means I'm rather old. And I retired from Bread for the World last year already. So please, uh, everything what I'm saying, don't attribute it to Bread for the World. I'm not uh, in any uh, position to speak for Bread for the World any longer. Thank you. 
the discussion today is important and it's entitled Local and Global Perspectives on the New Instability in Africa. Uh, as I do not really see a local Sudanese voice here at the panel, uh, let me at least try to communicate what I have been getting from many friends in the Sudanese civil society in a kind of desperate attempt to finally make also their voice heard uh, loud and clear. In the invitation, it stated we shall discuss implications which are especially hard to predict given Russia's involvement through the Wagner Group. This is, of course, uh, they play a very important role in military terms. Uh, we will hear about this later. But the involvement of the Wagner Group is by far not the only problem we face in Sudan uh, these days. And Russia's interest in Sudan is by far not the only one with serious implications. Uh, there are many players in the region, in the Arab world and far beyond. And uh, while the security advisor in the office of the president of South Sudan, interestingly an adapted son of the ousted dictator Omar al-Bashir, sent his family out of Khartoum two days before the war started, uh, Western internationals were obviously caught by surprise by heavy shooting and shelling in places like a tennis court on April 15, early morning. What we face today is a very tragic result of a homegrown structural problem. It, has, it was never addressed properly and only getting worse through outside interests and inappropriate attempts from outside to get it fixed using the argument of stability. A stability first and foremost, serving their own but not the interests of the Sudanese people. After Afghanistan, the international community was once again not prepared for what was foreseeable to come and Sudanese civil society has warned against time and again. It was not a matter of if, but only of when the two main military protagonists would clash and signs on the wall were written in big letters, do not trust the generals. This is why today we face serious war crimes once again and a humanitarian catastrophe possibly even in the whole region, which according to the words of Abdallah Hamdok, short time Prime Minister of Sudan after 2019, where the military uh, did a coup again in 2021 and uh, threw him out. And he warns that the humanitarian catastrophe in Sudan would top Libya, Syria, Yemen and others by far. As we speak this very moment, None of the ceasefires has been respected. People are being shelled at, at the same time. Dead bodies wait to be collected in the streets of Khartoum, in Omdurman and in Darfur, rotting in 40 degrees and more. Most hospitals are closed in the capital. At least 10 doctors were shot at. Others were taken hostage. Water, electricity uh, are not accessible in many places and people flee the country and try to escape from this nightmare uh, in, in, in their thousands. And the situation at the border in Egypt is desperate. Uh, right uh, yesterday we got the news that at least UN now starts to provide some assistance where Egypt is letting people in but not men uh, b uh, below 40, uh, 50. Sorry. Uh, and, um, and even many others uh, are not allowed to get in. Uh, many people tried to escape uh, from Darfur into Chad. Uh, also, there are no preparation on the ground. The poor refugees, which were uh, displaced uh, by the wars uh, and the situation in Eritrea and Ethiopia, are in the, at the eastern border so far, they can still be reached. But if they have to leave, uh, where, where, to, where to go to? And one of the biggest problems is also one million South Sudanese. Uh, you mentioned that I just returned from South Sudan. One million South Sudanese who ran away, had to run away from the many conflicts in South Sudan, the armed conflicts, and now have to run again into a very, very uh, terrible future because they have to go back to conflict areas. Uh, speaking about South Sudan, uh, when I was there, everybody was extremely, extremely nervous uh, that the next place where it would start is South Sudan again, which anyway is in, in such a terrible situation. Uh, UN organizations do not have enough money to even feed uh, or help and assist the South Sudanese already in, in, in this uh, situation. And now the, the bulk of refugees is uh, returning back. So we have a situation where communication gets more difficult by the day. 
where Sudanese uh, uh, friends, uh, those we can still reach when they have internet uh, uh, access, uh, tell us uh, that they feel we, they easily might be forgotten. And uh, those who really uh, are now, uh, let's say, helping uh, their, their people in Sudan are uh, uh, those from the neighborhood and resistance committees uh, who play a, played a very, very crucial role uh, during the revolution. And they are the ones providing the necessary uh, advice on, on where to go to, where it might be a bit safer. Not the whole of Khartoum is, is shelled at the same time. Um, so we have a situation uh, where already now uh, a peace movement is uh, has been started by Sudanese themselves. Uh, everybody is completely against this war. Uh, nobody wants to take sides. But... Uh, the longer this war will go ahead and the longer it will take, it uh, it might get to a situation where we face a complete disintegration of Sudan and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, a spillover and, um, uh, and serious consequences in a region which anyway is very uh, fragile and it's even not new. Uh, so it has been going on if you look at the countries which are neighboring Sudan uh, starting with uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia, going to Egypt, going to Libya, going to the Central African Republic, uh, and uh, Chad, of course, and last but not least, uh, the country South Sudan, where there are so many linkages uh, into Sudan, uh, including supporting uh, either uh, side uh, in, in the various wars. Uh, I think my time is already over. Uh, is that correct? Yes, you're very, very precise in sort of okay. time. Which Thank is Thank you all thank for, for a, a, a chairman. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, for giving us these insights. Um, as, as you say, we hear from, from Sudanese uh, far, too, far too little. Um, and uh, um, uh, very interesting also about, about um, you, your, your, your prediction of sort of uh, there's a danger of the whole country sort of falling apart, basically. Um, let's turn, turn, turn to, to Garrett now for, for his assessment and his... Uh, telling us a little more about, about the stabilization efforts that have been in place, but obviously haven't been working. Garrett, please. Uh, yes, thanks a lot. And uh, it's great that uh, I can speak after uh, Marina um, because I can really build on, on what you just said. Um, I mean, you mentioned the uh, civil society and, and civilian um, movement. Indeed, this uh, anti-war coalition that um, has been created um, after the start of the war is, uh, I think, a significant development. A civilian front, uh, they've been trying to, to establish that uh, for a long time, and, and hopefully this time, um, you know, it can be uh, an important force. Um, but coming to the stabilization or peacemaking and mediation efforts, um, they also in the past few years and now again um, have suffered from not including um, many of, uh, of, of, of these significant uh, Sudanese um, movements. Um, but some Sudanese have also been, been involved in, and I think we, we should also not, not forget that. So perhaps start a little bit from, from the beginning. Um, the search for elite bargains, for another deal, for another agreement, another compromise has been what has plagued uh, Sudan for decades. Uh, and that has been the case when it comes to um, our conflict and peace efforts, but also when it comes to uh, transition efforts. Um, so trying to uh, yeah, move towards uh, democracy. And uh, this is not just the UN that is at fault here, but uh, many internationals and uh, Sudanese politicians uh, as well. So um, perhaps just to give you a, a few hints, um, after the the main protests or the the the, the height of the protests in 2018-2019, um, the military, military tried hard after removing Bashir uh, to remain in power, um, but uh, and also with a lot of violence, but they didn't succeed. Um, and uh, this uh, 
mediation by the AU and Ethiopia, and uh, that came out into a constitutional declaration in August 2019 that started this civil military um, transition that that we saw. Um, but from the start, the military were not just involved in writing the rules of the game, which they also wrote in their favor, but the, also in the, the the political reality of actually implementing that that agreement, they gained in importance, and that was uh, because um, one important institution, the Transitional Legislative Assembly, the Transitional Parliament, uh, was never established, and this would have provided an important counterweight um, to this to the executive. And because it was not established. Um, legislative acts were then passed by the other two councils, that is the Council of Ministers, the Cabinet, and um, the Sovereign Council, which was only meant to be, according to the Constitutional Declaration, um, the a nominal collective presidency, basically. The executive power was meant to lie with the Prime Minister and his Cabinet, but that was never the reality. And so because the military had a significant role, including the, the chairmanship in the transitional uh, in the sovereign council, uh, they also had a significant role um, from the start in the day-to-day -day running of the government. Um, so move uh, fast forward to the military coup in October 2021. Again, the focus was on trying to get um, basically back to the, the, the status quo ante that, that was there before, which had evidently not worked, but civilians at least this time uh, didn't uh, agree. Um, and uh, the military had to, just had to recognize that they had to give up power, um, or at least commit themselves to a process. Yeah. I think we should be more careful, perhaps. Um, and so, so there, the UN, uh, the UNI Times, indeed, the UN mission headed by, by four Carpatas, um, got engaged a lot in, in facilitation and consultations, um, got a competition or a threat of competition from the African Union um, for a few weeks, um, but was then able to uh, get the AU and uh, EGATS, uh, the regional organization at the Horn of Africa, on board, and they formed this trilateral mechanism of UNITAMS, the AU, and IGAT, um, which performed, yeah, these, these facilitation. Still, the framework agreement that established, that established the aim of establishing a civilian uh, government, that was not uh, negotiated by this trilateral mechanism, but by a small group of Sudanese, uh, Sudanese civilian politicians together with uh, the military. Um, so today, um, the UN is still trying to um, mediate and, and especially to uh, get humanitarian access. Now, uh, as Marina already men mentioned, the emergency relief coordinator is in, in Sudan and uh, he wants to go to Khartoum and for face-to-face -face meetings with the leaders for humanitarian access. And it makes sense that they focus on that perhaps. But the, the mediation efforts for a, a for permanent and reliable ceasefire, they are not so much with the UN at the moment, but um, with US and Saudi Arabia on the one hand side, who do talk uh, with uh, civilian politicians from the forces of freedom and change, um, as well as with uh, IGAD led by South Sudan uh, on the other, uh, who appear not to talk uh, with uh, civilian politicians. Um, but have made this uh, grand announcement of a seven day ceasefire starting uh, today um, and the the readiness of both parties to send representatives to Juba for negotiations. I think it's it's fair to say if negotiations end up taking place in Juba, um, they will indeed be another transactional deal that um, will not be sustainable and will not bring lasting peace. Perhaps I leave it from that at the moment. Thank you very much, Gerrit. Um, yes, I think there are, there are many questions, um, uh, sort of, especially sort of what happens next. But we come come to that um, uh, in a moment. Um, let's hear now from Andras. Uh, when it comes to uh, Russia's involvement and involvement of the Wagner Group in the present conflict, um, one needs to keep in mind that this involvement hasn't started yesterday. I mean, the Wagner Group has had 
uh, substantial mining concessions in the territory of Sudan and also in, uh, in neighboring Libya. The most important uh, military assets of the Wagner Group are not in Sudan, but in Libya. And two days before the, the present conflict erupted, uh, it was observed that Russian military aircraft in Libya has been has started to make flights there and back from um, a Wagner head Libyan airport close to the Sudanese border. This is an old Ilyushin 76 uh, military transport aircraft, and Russians use these aircraft uh, to deliver weapons to the RSF. Most of the weapons delivered are actually anti aircraft missiles, uh, and these anti aircraft missiles enable the RSF to keep the air force, the enemy's limited air force of the government forces out of the conflict already managed to cause some losses. So these kind of weapons deliveries are not too large in size, in scale. We're not speaking here about dozens of tons of ammunition, but this is a very well targeted military involvement, namely by providing these, these anti-aircraft missiles. Uh, but the connection here in, in Libya, the Wagner Group has been actively supporting Khalifa Haftar already for years. And there is a Russian military air base in Libya on the Haftar-controlled territory where Russia has stationed transport aircraft and also fighter jets. Here, the Wagner Group serves only as a cover. Because the Wagner Group alone has never been able to operate as such complicated assets like, like, uh, like military aircraft. Private military companies and organizations like the Wagner Group, they are able to operate ground forces, artillery, some tanks, but not the complexities uh, required for uh, for keeping air assets, aircraft, fighter aircraft, operational particle, not under desert conditions. So here, what we see there uh, involved in this, these armed shipments, it's not the Wagner Group, I mean, as an, as an independent actor, but this is the Russian state, this is the Russian military. Uh, regarding Yevgeny Prigozhin's offer to mediate in the conflict, a few days after the conflict erupted, Wagner Group owner Yevgeny Prigozhin offered that he would be ready, ready to mediate in the conflict. This has not been offered uh, because Prigozhin would have any intention to actually get involved in the mediation, plus he doesn't have the trust necessary for any kind of mediation offer or for any kind of efficient mediation. This offer from Prigozhin, first, it's part of his media efforts to increase his own visibility, to make him appear more influential, more powerful than he actually is. So there is an there is a PR stunt element in this nego in, in this mediation offer. And there's another thing as well, uh, which explains or partially explains Wagner's global involvement, uh, namely that there is information that Vladimir Putin, Russian President Vladimir Putin, actually loves to read and hear about Russia getting globally involved in any conflicts. This actually explained um, Wagner's involvement in several African elections. The, the objective was not to win those elections. The objective was to win favors in the Kremlin. So this Prigozhin offer, this very well mediatized Prigozhin offer, to mediate also in the Sudanese conflict, this was not about Sudan, this was about increasing Prigozhin's influence both in the Russian public space and particularly in the Kremlin. The problem with the weapon, weapon shipments that so far, as long as this particular Russian aircraft is operational in Libya, there seems to be no way to stop these weapon shipments. These aircraft already made a few sorties to Syria because the Russian logistical hub they are using for supplying weapons also to Sudan. The route is Syria, so the Lataki air base, from Syria to Libya, inside Libya by air from the north to the south, and thereafter the weapon shipments close cross the border on land. The key element here is this Russian, this Russian aircraft and the Russian airfield uh, in Libya, which enables these weapon shipments. As long as these challenges cannot be countered, these weapon shipments are likely to continue. That's it for me for the start. And again, apologies that I need to leave very soon.
Thanks so much. So if you've got questions for Andras um, uh, via the chat or, or in person, sort of uh, get ready to, to ask them soon because we, we have to, to um, he has to leave in a moment. But maybe let, let's go to, to Marina back for a second, sort of what is what is your sense of what is happening next? You, you said there's a danger of, 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 of uh, Sudan sort of disintegrating, but uh, let's, let's take this as a sort of worst uh, worst case scenario. Um, what, what is you? What do you think? Sort of, will, 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 how, how this pro uh, conflict will evolve? Yeah, the problem is, uh, you see, as uh, as we already indicated, Russia, of course, uh, as we just heard, uh, plays an important role. But there are so many other players. Uh, so. Uh, uh, there are uh, Egypt, for instance, uh, is supporting uh, Burhan uh, tremendously. US is also supporting. We have uh, uh, the uh, Emirates uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia, very, very important players, also in, in arms delivery, partly through uh, various ways. Um, and they play an important role. We have this very fragile surrounding, as I try to uh, des describe uh, South Sudan anyway, uh, but also Ethiopia still has uh, has war uh, on its uh, territory, even if Tigray uh, has been uh, uh, kind of appeased uh, for a while. So, um, and in Sudan, so far as I try to explain, we do not have a civil war. So both sides, uh, the civil society is just, they just don't want this war. They just want peace. But the longer it takes, uh, also, those who now uh, appear as if they speak with one voice, AU, EGAD, uh, uh, and uh, Garrett already mentioned all of them, including uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, which was so instrumental also in, in taking uh, foreigners out, out and receiving them. Um, so far, they appear to speak with one voice. Uh, but the longer it takes and the more it gets clear on which side might won, uh, uh, win, uh, uh, the more they will support one side. That is one. The other thing is that always in such conflicts, the ethnic card can be played. Uh, and Hemiti is from Darfur. And I already hear from some of my Darfurian friends, ah, after all, we were always marginalized uh, and maybe this is our chance. So uh, this is the big danger. So until now, we have sa kind of safe heavens even inside Sudan where there is no direct fighting. Uh, but uh, we don't know how long uh, this will last. Uh, and uh, when you have such big numbers of refugees, of course, uh, and we, we speak about 800,000 up to a million might even get more very soon. Uh, it's it's uh, another problem, of course, uh, for neighboring countries. And I think Europe is also very much afraid that uh, some people might reach here. That is always an argument, which I don't share, but... Uh, but at least it's an argument in politics. So it's it's really, really, really terrible and difficult. Thanks very much. Uh, Gerald, sort of what is your sense of, of how things are, are developing? Maybe I can give you one one question, which maybe also is interesting uh, for the other panelists uh, by our colleague Nikolai von Schöpf, who asks sort of about the role of the West in the EU in particular. Um, sort of, is it sort of what could it do better in future? Or what role does it play maybe in the first place? Um, yeah, so I mean, indeed, as I said, I don't, I don't see that um, parties are ready uh, to uh, really uh, negotiate at the moment and and commit to to a lasting ceasefire. So um, it's probably going to take a while, and they're both uh, almost equally strong, uh, even though they have different military assets. But to the question of um uh, the eu so i think i mean um indeed the sahel also stretches into uh, sudan but um i believe the situation in in western and in the western and central uh sahel zone is and so in mali and pina faso um uh, is especially is different um than in in sudan for a start um sudan has um, a much, much larger security sector than these countries have. So these countries' problems to some degree also, you know, you know, I mean, they, they of course also have food governments now, um, but their militaries are very, very weak. So while the, the, the Sudanese, the regular Sudanese armed forces were kept weak also by, by Bashir and in, in the past also by building up rivals like the RSF and the the intelligence services were also, also had to 
um, the troops uh, in the past, um, there's still a much more significant force uh, than the the very uh, uh, small now, of course, uh, perhaps increasing militaries that we that we see in in, in these uh, countries. Um, so, so that also means that you have more and more the competition within the security sector, and in in Mali, you in Niger and in Burkina, you have. Um, Excel armed groups, so uh, jihadist armed groups uh, in particular, of course, uh, as, as well as well as other armed groups uh, that play a very important role, um, and so so that is that is uh, different. Um, the AU, I think, what we can do uh, now is uh, really, um, you know, you know, push for a different approach. Um, to peacemaking and and transition processes um, uh, in in Sudan and and I think that that would still be an important role. Um, Germany actually, for example, uh, was one of the leading countries when it uh, came to supporting Sudan's transition just only a few years ago in 2019, 2020. Germany co-founded the Friends of Sudan, um, a diplomatic group. Um, they uh, hosted the first uh, partnership conference uh, with and for Sudan in 2020. They um, were important officials, ministers, and uh, found the then German foreign minister Heiko Maas was the first uh, foreign minister to visit Sudan after the uh, new new government came into place in 2019. The German president was in Khartoum. Uh, Abdullah Hamburg, the prime minister, met Merkel in in Berlin. Um, and uh, in New York, in the U.S. Security Council, but Germany was uh, a member. They negotiated the mandate of of Unitas, uh, together with the U.K. So there was a lot happening, um, and and but that Germany was uh, leading, and it let it slide, uh, especially after after the military, because a lot of frustration set in. So I think we need also a lot of a lot a bit more patience and actually show up. Yes, Marina, please come in. Yeah, just very briefly. Um, I think uh, Garrett uh, already in the beginning stated uh, that these generals uh, gained more and more public profile and felt honored. Yeah. Uh, so, and and we of course were all working towards a civilian government, and that was the idea in the agreement. Uh, I just want to come in on uh, in the in the place of our president. To me. This visit of our president was a severe mistake, and I said it uh, by then already. Because if you send the highest representative of a country which is so well regarded and so important like Germany to a, into a situation which is fragile, where you still have the military and civilian rule and not the full civilian rule, I understand the. Uh, I always had uh, I had a, had a boss before. He always said the opposite of well done is well intended. So I, I know that they wanted to go to just uh, say, okay, we, we support the civilian component. But what happened was that these generals and others, they just said, ah, okay, we are, we are okay. Even the president of Germany comes, if I may say it in such simple words. So I think even here, we have to be very, very careful with who is visiting at what time. Thank you very much. I mean, one could maybe say also with an eye on Mali that that sort of the German government, or maybe most of, of of the Europeans have sort of trouble dealing with with uh, military dictatorships when they are when they are uh, in power. Um, it, it, is that true? Or sort of that then then we all sort of think of that's it. Um, we don't know what to do. Then is that is that true in your view, Kurt? Um, yeah, I mean, perhaps we have trouble with dealing with crises, uh, uh, this, this peace and security crisis, and yeah, with, with um, these these leaders in particular, because uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's a bit too much. It's in psychology, um, you know, um, but of course, here we we come from a world where. Uh, we believe in what people say, and we we take them seriously when they when they commit to to something face to face, um, and we believe in the rule of law, 
Um, and we will, and, and even though we know that actually it's not perhaps as simple also in, <laughs> in Europe, um, it's still the, the, the self image that we have, um, of, of us and, and especially for diplomats, um, and, and policymakers, I think that that's very much in their mind and how they've been socialized. So when they are actors and you know, you, you can, um, you can see that with these putsches, uh, with military uh, leaders, um, but also with uh, the Scrabble leaders um, and other violent entrepreneurs. Um, we, we have trouble, you know, showing empathy in the sense that, you know, we understanding what counts for them. And, 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 and I think, you know, what are their interests and incentives? Um, and, t- and too often we just take them by their word. Um, because that's what we're used to. That's how we do politics here, but that's not how they do politics. They are more concerned for their survival, political and physical, personal survival. Um, and that you know, creates a different kind of, of politics, um, but that, which is much more transactional, which many, many diplomats have, have trouble perhaps dealing with. Thanks very much. Um, uh, let's let's address two questions which have reached me via the chat. Um, there's there's one about the role of the so-called other armed groups, um, including SLM, GEM, Nubia Mountains. Um, sort of what what role do they play? And and another question um, is China also involved? In this China, of course, has expanded its sort of engagement with Africa um, vastly over the past uh, decade or so. Um, is is China playing any role? Maybe Marina first. Uh, China is, of course, uh, as, as, as you already stated, uh, is also present in uh, Sudan. Uh, China, interestingly enough, uh, they appointed their first ever envoy uh, for uh, in the Horn or in, in Africa during a time when we had still the war in Darfur, so uh, prior even uh, to, uh, uh, to to uh, 11. Uh, that was basically because of the interest in oil, but the oil is in the south. So uh, that was where they came in. And it was interesting because by then they did even not play a too bad role, let's say, because behind scenes, uh, because they wanted to protect their business interests, uh, they, they helped uh, to address uh, some, some issues, uh, I would even say in, in a positive way. China uh, has a uh, presence in uh, Port Sudan, uh, Port Sudan, the uh, city at the Red Sea, which is so important, where Russia also wants to build a military uh, harbor, uh, but it it's not agreed upon yet, uh, but they don't have military there. So yes, China is there. China plays an important role. Of course, also we have to look uh, where does China have other relations. We know, of course, about the Russian ones. Uh, we know uh, about this uh, global player uh, attitude. Um, so, uh, and as long and where the, uh, I think we have to really look at the whole issue also in in the setup of um, new in- zones of influence, of course, uh, in in the whole of Africa. And then this terrible uh, 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 situation we already had before during the Cold War, we have it basically again, that uh, wars are fought uh, on, on foreign soil, Stellvertreterkriege. Uh, uh, so this this all plays a role. And there was a first part of your question, which unfortunately I have forgotten. <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> Maybe do you want to add anything on China, Garrett? Otherwise, I repeat the question. Um, yeah, perhaps. Uh, uh, just to say that uh, um, I think their role has been reduced uh, quite significantly uh, with the secession of South Sudan in 2011, uh, as, as Marina pointed out, because them, their main economic interest was in oil. They have also other investments, and so Chinese also uh, actually in, in Sudan, so also they evacuated them now, for example. They also evacuated their embassy. But um, uh, there was uh, a note that made its round on uh, social media um, uh, posted by, by Sudanese, which appeared to be, be genuine, but I don't take guarantees there, which apparently was, was a note that the Chinese embassy posted on, on its gate saying if Sudanese had still passports there uh, because they had applied for visas, they could pick them up. And so 
so so that was something that many Western embassies did not do, um, and many Sudanese who had already uh, you know surrendered their their passports couldn't now flee the country because they didn't have a passport because it was still in these embassies which were not closed. Um, so I think also here, also in the the, the evacuation um, pictures from from China, um, they certainly try to use this also for their PR game. I think, yeah, that's what I can say. Thanks so much. Very interesting. This is exactly the, the, the discussion which is, which is popping up now, sort of whether whether the evacuation um, of the, those German embassies, sort of whether whether that was sort of thought out enough with this this problem you, you you're describing that, that 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 sort of people waiting for their visas have their have their passport now sort of uh, uh, knocked away basically, and, and uh, that's, a, that's a big problem. The other question was about uh, the role of other armed groups in this conflict. Is it only RSF versus SAF, or or is it sort of are there other players, internal players, uh, armed ones, which was sort of, and, and it was sort of what role do they play? Yeah, sorry, that is that is the part which I forgot. Sorry for that. So um, we, uh, if we look at the other um, groups, which were basically uh, those which were mentioned also in the question, Gem, uh, Justice Equality Movement, uh, and uh, and others, uh, these two are from from Darfur. Uh, so they came in through the so-called uh, Juba Peace Agreement. And interestingly enough, uh, it was Himiti uh, who, on behalf of the then government, brokered uh, that peace deal with the outstanding uh, uh, groups, uh, but not with all of them. So there's another one, Abdelaziz Alhilu in the Luba Mountains, who did not sign that agreement. But with the, uh, with the coming in of those groups, um, also we have to see that the military component in the then still working uh, uh, set up of military civil um, government was strengthened, strengthened, although they don't have big troops. So uh, what what we see is especially GEM, Justice Equality Movement, and their leader, Jibril Ibrahim, he is seen uh, very close to the old uh, cadres uh, of the National Congress Party, the party of Omar al-Bashir, but so is Burhan. Uh, so, uh, and Gibril was uh, one of the few uh, who stayed uh, in his uh, position as a minister for finance after the military coup. Um, and Mini Minavi also, he is, uh, 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 he is the, uh, at least by name the governor of Darfur, uh, although in, in action he does not, not really play a role. So uh, we they were see they were in um, in Egypt just before the latest events uh, and they were I opposing the new agreement to be signed uh, just before uh, before April 15 um, and uh, they formed a new coalition. So many saw them as uh, spoilers uh, of the deal to come. Uh, those at least who believed in that one. Now they keep rather silent, but I know uh, from from close sources uh, that they tried and and seriously tried uh, to to walk uh, between the two uh, uh, Hemiti and Burhan and to to persuade them to keep ceasefire because they also have a lot to lose. A bit of a joke, I thought it was that they now announced they would send their troops to Darfur to stand in between uh, the Saf and Hemiti's troops. Uh, uh, and and uh, guarantee the peace. This is nonsense. This is pure, pure propaganda. We have to really look at Darfur also, uh, if I may say that, uh, because uh, Jem and uh, and those of Mini Minabi, they don't have any basis in Darfur, not real basis. Abdel Wahid uh, Al Nur, who did not sign the agreement, the Juba agreement, he already signed uh, uh, the petition uh, for uh, stopping the war immediately. That is an interesting thing. And what we see in Darfur is serious, serious efforts of sheikhs, of other civil society groups to broker local peace. And I think this is something we really have to look at. We really have to support, even if it's not always holding. But all these efforts from the ground, uh, where people uh, from the ground who know all those around uh, try to do something, this is something which really needs all support wherever possible. Because if you want to get to sustainable the peace that is the only way sorry i talked long no no that's very interesting thank you very much um i've got a few more questions in the chat um uh, uh, garrett is there anything you wanted to add on, on the on the 
on the sort of other groups. Otherwise, no, I just want to move on. But then, uh, then maybe, maybe you first on the question, sort of what, what kind of role does sort of, um, um, uh, uh, migration, um, uh, to sort of uh, another refugee wave play, um, um, uh, Peter Schumann sort of writes in the chat that, um, it was, uh, Hemiji who actually has sort of threatened, uh, the EU in the past with sort of to open the refugee floodgates towards Europe. Um, um, is, is that something which sort of, uh, sort of comes into the calculation? Um, or, or is it is it rather a side aspect? Well, I mean, the RSF uh, has benefited and has grown in, in importance because of uh, Europe's um, anti-migration policy uh, in in the past. Um, the RSF assumed border police uh, functions um, and it basically did what what Europe wanted, you know, uh, to some degree at least, which was uh, control um, migration flows, but as far as they could, because Sudan is, is an important uh, country also of transition uh, for, for refugees from from the region. Um, but the ASEF has also been uh, involved in smuggling uh, itself. So I think they kind of played a double game uh, there, at least in the past. Um, and uh, Himiti has made these threats uh, also after the coup um, in 2021, so also, also relatively recently. Um, but of course, I mean, that plays on basically Europe's uh, racist vulnerability, um, but also, you know, on, on his actual ability to do that. And uh, I think that's that not that's not necessarily clear um, to what degree, you know, there are, there are many forces, as we also heard from, from unders, uh, operating in, in Libya, for example, which uh, of course is a main, main route there. Uh, we, and while the RSF has important relations also with, with Hafta, for example, um, and, uh, they are by no means the only ones. So. Um, I wouldn't be able to predict this this now, and uh, I think at the moment the the most important uh, pressure, as as Marina also said at the beginning, is on the neighboring countries, and um, which are often ill-equipped uh, to handle um, the 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 income of of people uh, their borders. That of course raises the question whether whether there should be more involvement or more help, sort of helping the neighboring countries uh, to, to 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 deal with the situation. I don't know, Marita, do you have any insights? Sort of, you you mentioned that the UN is sort of starting some 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 help uh, um, projects. Uh, is there sort of would there be more to do? Of course, there is much more to do. Uh, I think we again we we have this big problem. Uh, that UN uh, organizations basically all over uh, are already uh, facing a serious shortage of funding. So, for instance, in South Sudan, uh, the funding required even without the refugees coming in now, uh, it, it, the, the appeal was only funded, I think, by half or uh, uh, two thirds. So even there, they had to cut rations. Uh, and uh, of course, we we are uh, facing so many humanitarian uh, conflicts right now. And my fear is also, even if it comes to donations, uh, of course, uh, Sudan is far, so that many people do not see that uh, how much uh, 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 it's also our responsibility. So yes, uh, of course, NGOs uh, uh, are uh, starting uh, uh, this these wonderful Doctors Without Borders, of course, they already uh, try to to do whatever they can, even in country and so on and so on. But it's not enough, definitely not enough. It needs to be increased uh, tremendously. Uh, and that, of course, I saw in uh, in the chat also there was one question on what do Sudanese expect. Of course, they expect uh, to support uh, uh, humanitarian uh, uh, in a humanitarian way. Uh, but my advice on that question also is uh, we have quite a good number of Sudanese uh, uh, from Sudan directly uh, who are also related to the Sudan uprising uh, I mentioned before, uh, like like these resistant committees and, and so on. And I think they would be more than happy to be invited by members of parliament, by uh, 
um, sessions like this one and speak out so that we do not need uh, to to say uh, to be their voice any longer in this global world uh, but that they can speak with their own own voice and and tell us clearly what they expect and also where they expect us not to interfere and and meddling any longer Thank you very much, Gerrit. Um, sort of how to reach out or sort of how to, to help the, the, the Sudanese civil society, in addition of what uh, Marida has already told us. Anything else? I mean, I, I, I fully agree. Uh, I think with, with what Marina said, and uh, I think, uh, I mean, with uh, Chancellor Charles today in Ethiopia um, and then traveling on to, to Kenya, um, this week, uh, I think uh, he can also make that point um, with his interlocutors, uh, both his bilateral interlocutors in Ethiopia and Kenya, uh, but also um, with the African Union, um, whose uh, commission president he's also due to meet. Uh, because the African Union has been trying to coordinate uh, efforts uh, uh, internationally now for, for Sudan. Um, I'd say not completely successful, and and Kenya um, uh, is uh, or Kenya's president uh, William Ruto has been mandated uh, to travel to uh, Sudan. Um, we'll see whether that will actually take place. Um, but he's one of three uh, IGAD pres presidents who have been mandated by by IGAD, uh, so from Djibouti, uh, Kenya, and South Sudan, uh, and just. And after the, the fighting broke out, um, to go to uh, Sudan and, and mediate, and now from that the, the South Sudanese uh, effort came came as well. And I think um, perhaps we don't have so Germany doesn't nece necessarily have a lot of influence with uh, South Sudanese uh, South Sudan's president Sabah here, um, but Kenya Adam, and Ethiopia might. Um, and especially also, as as, Ruto, as I said, this is one of these three mandated parties, part of this team, basically. So I think that's that's a point that um, uh, Charles Schultz should drive home uh, clearly. Uh, and I think he will find open ears, uh, especially with the Kenyans. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there was another question about um, the role of Iran and Israel. In, in Sudan, is that something also which is sort of has an impact? Don't I say wrong, bring up, yeah. Marina? <laughs> yeah, I, I cannot really uh, uh, comment on Iran. Uh, Iran had quite some influence before, but I cannot cannot say much. Maybe Garrett can uh, uh, on, in the current situation. Israel is a different and interesting story because, uh, of course, uh, um, although Sudan is not an Arab country, but it's a member of uh, Arab League, and uh, uh, for many, 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 many years, uh, it has had uh, no uh, uh, no relations, no official relations with Israel. But uh, of recently, it it has, and that's an interesting fact that uh, under the military regime, now the relations with Israel uh, were, uh, uh, yeah, were were just make, uh, made um, official. Uh, and Israel also, uh, uh, alongside with Turkey, they also uh, announced they would be ready to uh, mediate in this conflict. So I would not say that uh, Israel has a very big direct uh, influence at the surface. So it's not much we can directly see. But knowing uh, who Israel is also allied to, uh, there the influence might come in. <laughs> yeah, and the Israeli foreign minister Cohen was uh, in Khartoum in February um, mm. because he wanted to ensure that uh, Sudan would actually go through with signing the, the Abraham Accords, normalizing the relations. Uh, with, with Israel, as it uh, had promised uh, already a few years ago, uh, indeed. And um, so Israel's relations are mainly with the security sector, with both, not with RSF and SAF and the uh, Sudanese armed forces. Um, so if they mediate, you know, um, 
I am also uh, doubtful that civilian uh, voices, uh, civilian perspectives would figure largely there. Um, perhaps one, one interesting aspect was a report uh, late last year um, that I think also made headlines in Israel, um, but also internationally that um, the RSF had imported spyware, so surveillance software, very powerful surveillance software that was made in Israel. Um, so they had apparently uh, imported it from Cyprus, uh, but the software is Israeli made um, and it's uh, currently already back then. Uh, in, in November, uh, Himiti tried to use that and tried to hide that from uh, the Khan, from the armed forces, because it provided him potentially with such a benefit or advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the armed forces. Thank you very much. Um, one sort of more detail, well, one question relating to the UN mission, uh, UNITAMS. This is the one which is, is headed by, by Volker Pertus, if, if I'm not, not completely um, uh, mistaken. Um, uh, sort of uh, the point uh, Peter Schumann is making in, uh, in the chat is that it sort of did it, did it receive enough uh, political support from key players, including from the United Security Council, United Nations Security Council, um, or, or, or um, sort of is there sort of a disconnect or sort of not, not was this support for by the international community not strong enough for this particular mission? Um, I think uh, Peter Schumann might be even in the best position to answer this question himself because he's a former UN representative. And uh, so uh, I think he could, could would lo even love to talk about that one. Um, we have to look at, of course, at the situation the Security Council is in. Uh, and uh, uh, we know also uh, what what happened in in case of Ukraine, who is supporting which uh, resolution to come in, and so on and so. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Sudan is not the highest on the agenda, although it plays such a crucial role for the whole region and beyond, as we try to point out. So definitely, there could have been more support, uh, without any doubts. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we have this terrible state uh, of the Security Council right now. Maybe before we close, because we are just about to close, I see, uh, uh, everybody always wants to know how to, to get out of this terrible situation. Uh, of course, uh, ceasefire and so on, humanitarian aid, pre-positioning of uh, medical aid and so on and so on is, is key, uh, but it's not a long-term solution. And we I think both Garrett and I, we try to, uh, to underpin that any solution which again comes from outside, not really addressing the root causes, not really having a transparent process, not really uh, involving more people than just a few parties as uh, 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 and a few elites in Sudan will not get us anywhere. There will be no lasting peace. And that is uh, especially the message which the Sudanese uh, uh, civil society representatives told us time and again. Uh, throughout the last four years. So we need a process where we can solve our problems once and forever, which is Sudanese-led, of course, with the assistance of international uh, players. But we call you when uh, when we need you and we will set the agenda. This is more than, um, let's say, wishful thinking. I think we are all enough, we all know enough about real politics, uh, but I think we really need to take this voice very, very serious once and forever. Thank you very much. An excellent sort of closing remark already. Um, but but Garrett, maybe maybe you've got got a minute um, or maybe less, uh, uh, also to address this question and sort of you already sort of started to 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 put it in context with the overall Africa policy um, of the the current current German government. Um, is it the the evacuation bed very well in sort of military and terms? But is sort of um, uh, is this sort of overshadowing what hasn't hasn't gone so well? And, and what what could 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 uh, the choice government do even better? But I, I think as I said already, um, and then Marina also said, and I think um, um, it can support a different approach, and then it can invest more again in this also diplomatic coordination um, uh, on Sudan, and I think that that would be really important. And I think it's indeed important to realize that. It's not in the interest of these uh, security forces to continue fighting for a long time because they will lose. Um, they are losing already. They they will emerge a bigger from this. Um, and the Sudanese politicians they already know this. They they are saying this. So and I think the the sooner that we realize 
that it's not just about the men, of men with guns, um, that they cannot be trusted, that they are not reliable partners, yeah, even though they have guns. Um, this the better. Thank you very much, um, uh, Marina, Peter, and uh, Gerrit Kotz uh, for um, for this interesting, interesting uh, conversation and your insights into the crisis, um, which which we, we understand sort of probably has to get a little worse before it gets better. Hopefully, um, thank you all for for coming this morning for attending our GD, uh, DGRP uh, morning briefing. Um, and uh, with that, thanks again to our panelists. Uh, thank you for for attending. I wish you all a very good morning and see you next week. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.